Christchurch Hillcrest. It's good to be here this morning and it's really nice that it's not quite so hot as it was yesterday. Welcome and uh, to any newcomers, a special welcome and please feel free to stay on afterwards, have a bit of tea and coffee and uh, with Eskim uh, blessing us with good electricity this morning, you can have um, proper coffee, <laughs> proper beans, proper grinding, all, all of that. And let us come to a time of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you today to praise and worship you, the creator of all things. All we see, experience, and have has come from you. We thank you for all our many blessings. The air we breathe, the sunshine, the rain, are all supplied by your creation. Help us today to be convicted of our sinfulness and the need of the salvation provided by the sacrifice of your son Jesus on the cross for our sins. As we come to communion later, Help us grieve for our sin and be thankful for our path to salvation through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, Jean is going to come up and pray for us. Alistair will be reading for us and uh, then Stuart will come up and uh, give us the lesson. After that, Jomo will officiate with the uh, uh, with the communion. So, Jean. Good morning, church family. It's such a privilege to be asked to say the prayers this morning because Roy and I have been away on holiday for quite a while, but it's always wonderful to come back to South Africa, the land which God has so beautifully created for us. But it's also a land that's torn by bitterness and anger. So it's going to be my prayer this morning and my hope that we who love our Lord will be a light to those in the darkness. And I'm trusting that our hope lies in our Lord's hands at all times. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we rejoice in your beautiful creation those lovely warm winter days that have just passed, and now the spring that will be full of sunshine, birds and flowers. We praise you for our blessings of family, love and safety. We praise you because we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Lord, we ask you for your protection and healing in this time of turmoil. Many live in fear and insecurity. We ask that you deliver us from the hopelessness that surround us on social media and the mouths of those who would have us live in fear and negativity. Let the hope that you assured us of, that blessed assurance that Jesus is ours, fill us with joy and faith in the knowledge that you know full well what is happening in the world, that the pain that we feel may help us to grow and learn, that we may love more, give more, and trust more. Give us the peace and the strength to stand strong in the face of adversity. Gracious Father, we know that we live in a fallen world, a world that rewards greed, power, and celebrity status, a world that says whatever makes you feel happy, good, strong, and satisfied with your life is yours for the taking. If it makes you feel good, do it, take it, and own it regardless of the sorrow that it may bring to others. This world is so full of crime, corruption, violence, and evil. But Lord, we know also that goodness, kindness, gentleness, and love also abides in our world. Help us to be a light in this world, Father. Let the Holy Spirit that lives within us, the Spirit that gives us life because we have been made right with you, guide our actions. Let us bring no harm to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Let not hate, harbour, anger, or judge others. 
Let us show a loving and giving spirit, one that will bring joy and peace to others. We are weak, but you are mighty. Hold us in your powerful hands. Make us strong and courageous. You are our strong deliverer. Be our help and our shield. Let the light of your face shine upon us. Let your hand be our comfort. And we ask especially for those who are ill, in pain, in poverty, in financial ruin, in marital warfare. Those who have lost hope and can see no way forward. We ask that you make your presence felt in their lives. That they may know that you are their healer and comforter. That you are their strength. That you are the way, the truth and the life. And may they surrender themselves to you. Give them strength, courage and hope to bear whatever they are struggling with. May they know that at the end all their sorrows will be no more. They will live in glory with you, God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son and the Holy Spirit, the three in one, the one and only true God. It is holiday time now for many children. May they be safe in their freedom from books and studies. May they have happy times with family and friends. We thank you, Lord, for those who have given of their time to teach these children and can now rest. We thank you also for all those involved in children's church and Sunday school. They are special people, Lord, and we ask your blessings upon them. Especially bless your servant, Jomo. Continue to give him the strength and perseverance he needs for body and soul. We also ask blessings on Stuart as he gives us your message from the gospel of our Lord. Give us clear minds and open hearts to receive the message and to live in a way that is pleasing to our Lord. Let the gospel be our manual for life and Jesus Christ, our Saviour and Lord. Keep us safe and well during the coming weeks and may your spirit be with us always. Amen. Good morning. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning, uh, CCH. Wonderful to be with you again. Uh, my name is Stuart. If you didn't catch that, I'm from Christchurch, Pinetown. And I'm coming to the conclusion that Hillcrest doesn't really like me. Uh, because every time I'm here, it seems to be colder than it should be. Um, and that's also coming from a boy who grew up in Zululand. So it's always a bit of a shock to the system. Uh, but I can say that uh, every time I've been here, I've been warmly welcomed. And that always uh, helps. Uh, I am. We are in what's been called one of the greatest books in the Bible, perhaps the greatest chapter in one of the greatest books in the Bible. So if you'd keep that open, it'll really help me as we work our way through these four verses. Um, but would you bow with me as we, as we pray and ask God for his help? <clears throat> Father, we have gathered this morning uh, to hear you speak to us. We pray that we would hear these words, not as the words of men, but as they truly are, uh, the words of the living God, um, spoken to each of us individually. Uh, help us to receive them by faith. 
help us to uh, readily listen and uh, obey what we hear. Lord, we, we pray that this chapter, th- these verses might uh, put concrete into our spiritual legs, that they would give us a deep assurance that we are your children uh, through the Lord Jesus Christ and that nothing can separate us from you and your love. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, as we come to a holiday time, maybe some of you this week are going to get some some time off and go away. Uh, It's been said that half the pleasure of going on a holiday is the anticipation beforehand. Uh, So I think we've all experienced that. Uh, The last two weeks before a trip, we start to get super excited Um, We know that it's not long before we pack our bags, we get in our car, and we drive off to our favorite campsite, uh, that happy place of ours in all the world, or or we, we get onto that shipping cruise, or we go on that all expenses paid trip to France to watch the World Cup rugby final uh, that I see advertised everywhere around me. Uh, And it's like this this buzz comes over you, uh, and you feel like you're able to tolerate anything that comes your way, because you know that in a few days' time, you're going to be sipping mocktails on the beach. Something difficult comes up at work, and you say, it's okay, I can get through that. Your kids are acting out, and you say, no problem. I can handle that with all of the gentleness and the patience in the world. Why? Well, it's because the eager anticipation of what's to come influences your present attitude, your behavior. But I want to say this, this will only happen if two things are beyond doubt, if two things are not in question. Without these two things, we will not have that that excitement, that confidence. What are they? Well, the first is that you need to be confident that your destination is as good as it appears. So it's happened before where you, you go onto that website or you open that brochure and you see these incredible pictures of what looks like the Garden of Eden. And you think to yourself, wow, this place looks amazing. And so you book your spot. And just a few days later, you, you're chatting to a friend and they say, oh yeah, they've stayed there before. And those pictures were really taken about 20 years ago. The place is now run down. It doesn't have half the amenities that it was advertising. You know, is the destination worth it at that point? Is it, is it worth all of your saving up? Is it worth taking leave for? Is it worth driving a thousand kilometers to get to? Well, in the passage before this one, in verses 17 to 25, uh, that really is the same question that suffering Christians are asking themselves as they make their way towards heaven. You know, is heaven going to be worth the persecution that we're going through now? Is it worth being mocked by my friends? Is it worth the the tragedy of cancer and viruses and natural disasters and unemployment? Is it worth the pain of death? And Paul says in verse 18, basically, yes. Yes, it is worth it. In fact, where the Christian is headed is so glorious that you can't even compare the two. If you were to put present suffering on one side and future glory of heaven on the other, then future glory would be so heavy that the scale wouldn't even lift one bit. You see, knowing that changes how you face suffering. It now gives us hope. It makes us eager And we can become patient as we wait for eternity. But there's one more thing that we need to know about. 
not just that our destination is worth it, but we need to have the reasonable assurance that we will get there. Right? There's no use knowing that your holiday destination is amazing if you aren't sure you're going to be there to enjoy it. Right? Uh, if there is terrible weather that is forecast, or you feel like you might be starting to get the flu, um, or maybe there's a query over a double booking, well then doubts are going to set in and, and you're going to say to yourself, well I mustn't really set my hopes on this happening. Who of us has, has never felt like that during a, a season of, of suffering or hardship? You know, you, you, it's in those moments that you ask yourself, am I really God's child? Why is my life working out this way? And will I get to that eternal life that God promises to us? And in our passage today, Paul is going to say, yes. Yes, you will get there. And that's because God has a plan. And everything is going according to that plan. God will achieve his plan no matter what comes our way. I think that is the main uh, idea of these verses. It's, it's what it's all driving at. And we see uh, that idea come up twice in our passage. In verse 27, if you just glance with me, it says, uh, The Spirit prays for us according to the will of God. Verse 28 is that all things in life are coordinated by God for good for those who are called according to his purpose. You see, God has a plan. Before he created anything, he had prepared this plan. Everything in history has been going according to this plan. And nothing is going to stop God from completing this plan. See, if you've turned from your sin, if you've trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you are part of that great plan. God decided from before time that he would include you in that great plan. And that is what uh, is meant by that word predestined in verse 29. Well, what is this great plan of God that he's predestined us to be a part of? What is that, that, that masterpiece that he's painting on the canvas of the universe? Well, we're told at the end of verse 29, it's this. To be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. You see, this grand plan is all about Jesus. It has him at the center of it. It's saying that on the final day, when God wraps up this world and he creates a new world, all those who've trusted in Jesus will become like him. We will get new bodies like his new resurrected body, and we will be with him for all eternity it's all about Jesus. God's plan is to perfect a family for Jesus forever. And everything is going according to that plan. These verses are going to give us then three guarantees that God will get you through the pain and the suffering of this life. That he will bring you to the glory that is to come. So the first guarantee is the Spirit's prayerful presence. The Spirit's prayerful presence. Uh, the wonderful news uh, you know is that as Christians, we are not alone. Uh, God didn't just save us and say, it's up to you now to get yourself to heaven. We'll, I'll meet you at the finish line. No, he doesn't do that. He gives us his Holy Spirit to be our guide, to be with us. So verse 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us 
with groanings too deep for words. You see, there are moments in this life that are so demoralizing that, that we can hardly think straight. We don't know how to pray. You know, because we are so weak, there's valleys of darkness that can overwhelm us and leave us so confused at times that we just don't know what to pray for. Suffering has a way of silencing us, and we don't know the words to speak to our Father right at the time when we need to speak to Him most. You know, do we pray for God to take away this, this trial that we're going through? Do we pray for God to give us strength to endure it? Do we pray for God, perhaps, to take us home to be with him? Can you remember how this happened to Paul, right? Three times he prayed for God to take away this thorn in his flesh. We're not told what this, this thorn was. But three times God basically said no. And he revealed to Paul that uh, Paul would need to rely on God's grace, that that is enough for him to live with this thorn in his flesh. And so when Paul knew that, he was led to pray differently about this trial, this suffering. He didn't know how to pray. And so we can take comfort that if the Apostle Paul didn't always know how to pray through his suffering, it's okay that we don't know how to pray through ours. That is why God has given us his spirit. We have a friend beside us who is ready to pick up where we have left off. The spirit prays on our behalf. That prayer, by the way, it's not an audible prayer. Um, it, it, it's a prayer that we, we probably, we're not even aware is, is happening. But it is happening for us. The spirit is pleading for us to God the Father. And that means, the good news is, we can have confidence that God is going to answer those prayers. Whatever the Spirit is praying, God will answer that. Because we're told in verse 27, that God who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. See, the Spirit knows what God's will is for us, and He prays according to that will. And therefore, God's answer to the Spirit's prayers are always going to be yes. One Christian writer said that there are times when the most deeply theological prayer is, God, I don't know what to pray for, but you do and your spirit will. It means that we can have confidence that our inability to pray at times when we need him most is not going to count against us. It's not going to prevent God from working out his will in our lives. Even in the deepest grief, even uh, facing the most terrible evil, um, in, in the valleys of depression, when even thinking of praying is too difficult. We are never, ever alone. God in us is speaking to God above us. And the answer is always yes. So friends, take heart. Everything is going according to plan. We can set our hearts on heaven. It is safe to do so. God assures us of his Spirit's prayerful presence. But the second thing that we have is God's promise. God's promise in verse 28. Famous verse, listen to these words. We know that for those who love God, that, that's describing a Christian. It's not a promise for everyone. It's for those who love God. All things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Okay, this, you could say without exaggeration, is perhaps the greatest promise in all of the Bible. And what 
I think makes this promise so amazing is those two words, all things. All things. See, everyone expects that uh, good things will turn out for good. But it isn't easy to see how evil things can turn out for good. A fatal car accident or, or the loss of your job because you spoke too much about Jesus. Uh, theft, corruption, murder that is taking place. Whatever it is, those things that we experience, it's not easy to see how those things can be for good. They themselves are not good, right? They are evil things. God is grieved by those things. They are a big deal. And the pain doesn't magically disappear because God can use these things for good. But at the end of the story, our story, they will turn out for the ultimate good. They are part of a much larger plan that God has for us. Our sufferings, that means, if we believe that, our sufferings are not obstacles which get in the way of us reaching our destination. If we believe that, then they are allowed by God to steer us towards that destination. It means we can be sure that God works like this. And if he didn't work like this, then there would be no cross, there would be no salvation. You and I would not be Christians. If God didn't work like this, none of us would be Christians. Why is that? Well, if you look at the cross from a human perspective, it's difficult to see it as anything but evil defeating good. It is, without exaggeration, the most evil act that was ever planned, ever committed by humans in history. Because what we are talking about is many people coming together, conspiring to kill someone who is innocent and call it an act of justice. And the way that they decided that Jesus would die was the most horrific way to die that was yet invented. It was against the most innocent person who ever lived, the kindest, most compassionate person who ever lived. And we know, on top of that, that it was God himself in the flesh that they were crucifying. And therefore, that must be the last possible event that you would expect to turn out for good. Not even the apostles who were told the plan, imagined that anything good could come from the cross. And so they ran. They left Jesus. But in the hands of God, that is exactly what happened. And Peter finally got it. In his first ever sermon in Acts chapter 2, verse 22 and 23, he says these words. He says, Men of Israel, Hear this, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. He's saying, Israel and her leaders, you are responsible for crucifying Jesus. It was your evil intentions that put him on that cross. But at the very same time, everything was going exactly according to God's plan. In the very same act, while humans were working the greatest evil possible, God was at work to achieve the greatest good possible, our salvation. Because Jesus, as we know, was not just another human death. He was God in the flesh dying for our salvation. So that we could have 
eternal glory with him. And if God can do that with the sufferings of Jesus, which we have to believe as Christians, how can he not do that with your and my sufferings? Is that not an easy thing for him to do? Corrie ten Boom was a, a brave uh, Christian woman during World War II, and she, she risked her life to hide Jews from the, the Nazis. And she wrote a poem that illustrated the, the promise of Romans 8.28 so well. It, it's, it's called the, Master's, the Master Weaver's Plan. And she says this, My life is but a weaving between my God and me. I cannot choose the colors. He weaveth steadily. Oftentimes he weaveth sorrow, and I in foolish pride forget he sees the upper and I the underside. She means that, that God's plan for our life is like a, a beautiful tapestry. And the upper side of that tapestry is an image that is woven together by lots of different color threads. The underside of the tapestry is just a mess of loose knots and ends. It doesn't look like anything. And she is saying that in this life, we only get to see the underside of what God is doing. And we wonder in all of the, the pain and the sad times, what is God up to? It looks like a complete mess. But she says we don't lose hope because we have this promise from God that when he's finished, he's going to turn it around and we will see this masterpiece that he's been working on all along. She could say this going through the horrors of World War II. The dark threads are as needful in the weaver's skillful hand as the threads of gold and silver in the pattern he has planned. <clears throat> See, if we cling to this, this promise, if we try to live every day like we believe it, that is going to give us a very deep assurance through ups and downs in our lives. And if I could apply this, I think it will, it will take away these, these two things that control our lives, which hold us back in, in life. And, and here are these two things. It's, it's regret and it's fear. You know, we, we tend to look back to the past and we dwell on our regrets. Uh, there's something that we still blame ourselves for. We wish didn't happen. And we, we think of it more often than we should. We relive the shame of that. We revisit maybe our bitterness towards others who hurt us. And equally true is that we struggle with fear, with anxiety when we look towards the future. We read the headlines. Uh, we see... Uh, the crimes committed around us, we worry about our children, perhaps, and their future. And before we know it, the, the regret from the past, the, the fear for the future, they take over our present lives. And we go through life insecure, discontent, and overly cautious about everything. God's promise, this promise comes to us and it says... Don't regret what I, in my infinite wisdom, have decided to use to conform you to the image of Jesus, my son. And don't fear what might happen to you, but you can trust that I only allow it to happen, to lead you towards your future glory. I think if we believe that, then Christians will be the most confident, fearless people. Because who else has a promise like that? Who else has a guarantee like that in life? I think of Nicholas Ridley and Hugh Latimer in the 16th century uh, during the reign of Bloody Mary. And they were burnt at the stake. Um, for their Protestant beliefs. And one of them turns to the other and says, just before they're about to die, be of good cheer, 
we shall let yet light a candle in England which shall never be put out. They're speaking about their bodies there, dying for the gospel, lighting a candle which will never be put out. How do you go to your death like that with such confidence, fearlessness? It's only because you have to believe a promise like this, that even this that you are going through, God will use for good, great good in your life and in the life to come. I don't want to move on to the next point just yet because I want to, to talk about a couple of ways I think that we misapply this promise of Romans 8.28. I think it's just as important as, as, the, as the ways that it does apply. Um, so here are a few thoughts. This is not a promise for, for breakthroughs in this life. Okay, the, the good that is being spoken of here is eternal life and anything that helps us get to that. <coughs> So the good here is not a more comfortable life now. It's not a more successful life here and now. So, for example, we would be abusing this promise if we tell someone who's just suffered a breakup or, or a divorce, let's say, don't worry, uh, God had to take you through this because he has someone better planned for you. He's going to use this for your good of a better partner. Now, we don't know that. God might do that. But that's not the promise here. It's not a promise that we can expect something good in this life that aligns with our comfort or our happiness. Uh, that's not what God is committing to. Another way that I think we misuse the promise is we give cold comfort to other Christians. And I think sometimes we do this unwittingly with, without knowing it. But we end up giving cold comfort with this promise. So what do I mean by that? Well, uh, one of my um, lecturers at Bible College in the UK uh, had a disabled daughter. And he said when uh, that, that news broke, um, became known that she was, she was disabled, they began receiving what he called the Romans 828 treatment. Uh, he said it, it begins with a smile before 828 is quoted. And then it's followed by another smile. And in that smile, you were expected to smile and to nod and be comforted. Now, did he believe Romans 8.28? Of course he believed Romans 8.28. I don't think he would have got through that time if he didn't. But, here's the point. We don't wave that promise around like a magic wand. It just makes everything better. It just makes the pain go away. He said he wished people would sit with him and read Romans 12, 15. Weep with those who weep. So I want to say, if we're going to speak this promise into each other's lives, and it's good that we do, just be careful when we speak to someone who's suffering that we don't do that in a flippant way, in a trite way, to, to, to dismiss what they are feeling, what they are going through. Okay, well, Paul now turns to talk in more detail about what the good is that God is working all things towards. And that's my final point is God's plan. God's plan. Look at verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. What Paul gives us here is a five-stage plan, which theologians have called the golden chain. Why is it called the golden chain? Uh, well, it's because each of those five stages of God's plan that he foreknew us, predestined us, called us, justified and glorified us, each of those are a link in a chain that cannot be broken and which leads us to glory, to heaven. That is why it's the golden chain. And the good news is even if you don't understand what those five theological words mean, 
you can still get the point of what Paul's saying. You don't actually have to understand those five words to know what he means, although I think it's more encouraging when you do. What he's saying is, whatever God starts, he finishes. There are no dropouts in God's school of salvation. Everyone who comes in will go all the way. As Philippians 1 verse 6 says, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It's because it is 100% up to God, and he is going to make sure that it happens. To be a Christian is to mean that God has already got you to stage four of the plan. Sounds a bit like load shedding, so that's not necessarily the best connotation. But this, this, these stages are good, okay? God has already got us to stage four of the plan. Well, let's see how that's happened. Well, the first stage, God foreknew us, okay? That means that before time began, you existed, I existed in the mind of God, and he chose to set his love on us. He determined to know us personally. Before we could ever know him, before we could ever love him, we weren't even born. God foreknew us. The second stage in the plan is that God predestined us. Now many Christians freak out about that word predestination. I'm not sure why, because for Christians it's actually a comfort for us to believe it. When scripture talks about it, it's, it's, it's an encouragement to say, you're going to make it. But it seems to be controversial. I'm not going to say much more about it because I'm just saying there it is in the Bible. Um, it's in the Bible. It's taught by the Bible. Uh, God says it. And so what that means is that God does predetermine before time whose final destination would be heaven. Third is that God calls us. God calls us. That is now what happens to someone at some point in time, when we are born in this life. Jesus calls us into a relationship with him. In fact, he, he commands us into a relationship with him. He brings us to him. Yeah, you know, at the time that you, you became a Christian, at the time of your conversion, it may have felt as if you were the one who was seeking God, you were the one who found God, you were the one who chose to believe in God. And that is true from your perspective. But here we are told that operating underneath that, at the same time as that, God was calling you to himself. He was actually seeking you. He was giving you faith to believe in him. And the fourth thing God did is he justified you. He justified you. At the same time that he called you, he justified you. That means he, he said, you are now in the right with me. You stand in the right with me. You are innocent. You are forgiven and nothing is going to change that. <clears throat> so, to be a Christian means that God has acted on you to move you through four stages there is only one stage left for you and I. One day God will glorify you. That is, make you like Jesus in every way. That's the final stage. But you'll notice in, in verse 30 that the tense Paul writes that in, he doesn't say, those whom he justified, he will glorify. He says, he glorified. It's as if the action has already been completed. As if we are already with Jesus in our new resurrected bodies in the new world. But you and I know that's not true. Why? Why has he put it like that? It's because that's how sure we can be that God is going to complete the final stage in the plan. It's as if it's already happened. The golden chain cannot be broken. He's not going to leave us at stage four 
no matter what sin we commit, no matter how much we've suffered, God is going to finish the process. And that is why we can look to the future with absolute certainty. We can have hope. So, friends, what can we say from, from all of this as we wrap up? If you are trusting in Christ, then there is a heavenly destination God has prepared for you. And it is worth it, no matter how hard the path is to get there. But more than that, God has given us every reason to be confident that he will get us there. This life is only a brief period of time before we will be there. And so our bags need to be packed. Our anticipation of what is to come needs to influence our present attitudes and behaviors. It needs to influence how we wait. And so we are becoming bolder, I hope. We are, we are leaving fears behind, regrets behind. We are convinced that God has a plan and that everything is going according to that plan. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I, I don't know what some people here are going through at the moment, what, what loss they've experienced, um, what insecurity they have when they look towards their future, um, what dark clouds have gathered overhead. But Lord, I thank you that in the midst of that, you speak promises the light of future glory can shine back into that situation and can give us real hope that we know that you work like this because we've seen it at the cross. We've seen how you've used the worst act of evil to achieve the greatest good. We celebrate this meal that we are going to come to now, remembering that very thing, you are feeding us by the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. His sacrifice, his suffering for our sin was worth it. It achieves for us the hope of eternal life where we will celebrate that meal one day fully and finally in its reality. And so may you feed us now and keep us till then. In Jesus' name, amen.